Thanks, Stuart. That was nice. You're going to tell us today something about piping and pipe music at the Battle of Killiecrankie and piping in Scotland in the 17th century. Clearly, you weren't paying the bagpipes most of us are used to seeing and hearing. What type of pipes were you playing and what tunes did you play? Thanks, James. Yes, these pipes that I was playing there are the lowland pipes and they are, as you can see, bellows blown as opposed to mouth blown. Um, I thought I'd begin this way because these are the type of pipes that were heard most around Scotland, all over Scotland, as it not the Highlands, the Lowlands. These were the pipes that were um, heard most as a whole. They were played in the towns in the, in the Lowlands uh, at this period, but these pipes more or less disappeared quite a while ago when the main demand from pipe makers was for that one, the Great Highland Bagpipe. And this was a, as a result of Highland regiments being raised for the British Army in the following century, uh, and the one after that. And because of the job, the role of, the civic role of the town piper was disappearing by, 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 by that time as well, mostly. It's still hanging on in some place, but I'm talking here late 18th century onwards. You talk about a town piper? Yes, most towns in Scotland employed uh, a piper, sometimes accompanied by a, a drummer, to go around early in the morning to awaken people, to play in the evening to, to, to make sure they were going to bed. <laughs> it's almost like a glorified alarm clock, I suppose, <laughs> but uh, to play at harvests, to play at all sorts of civic occasions, general entertainment for dancing, uh, private occasions, and just key times throughout the calendar of the people, uh, their lives. And being being a lowlander, James Graham of Claverhouse, which is, you know, is just outside Dundee. Growing up, he would have been used to hearing this type of bagpipe. Certainly not that. That would have came later during his military career, but he would have heard this one rather than that. Rather than that one. And certainly James Graham of Claverhouse, he was Viscount Dundee and he commanded the Jacobite forces here at Killiecrankie. Yep. And so that's the relevance of him being yep. here. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So these pipes then, the Great Highland Bagpipe, the Scottish Small Pipe, the Lowland Pipe, or it's got a name, the Border Pipe, Real Pipes, um, these are the pipes played in Scotland in the 17th century. They're just, these are just three, well technically two forms, that's bellows, that's mouth blown, so that's really two forms of bagpipe that appeared all over Europe from around 1100 onwards and spread rapidly in various forms. And we can deduce that the more conservative Gaelic people in Scotland didn't actually accept that bagpipe until um, possibly around 1400, uh, although it is impossible to, to put dates to, to when drones were added because the pipe at that time, there's no way it was like that. Well, we know it wasn't like that. We've seen drawings and diagrams and carvings that had one drone, it had two drones, then at some point the large drone was added. So it's run about the 16th, sorry, the 17th, 18th century that it becomes like that, the Great Highland Bagpipe. And it's more or less, well, in fact, it has, it's stayed the same ever since. Bellows blown small pipes, not hugely unlike these, but probably with eight holes. So there's eight holes in the front of this chanter and there's one at the back. Bellows blown small pipes originally probably have had eight holes, uh, had a key on them so you could go up and down an octave but these here are essentially 
they're modern and they're, they're designed, they're, they're styled on these older pipes. But I just, when I asked the maker to make me these, I just wanted like that to make it easier for me, I suppose, uh, to play rather than have keys and stuff like that. Um, the Northumbrian pipes are very similar, quite similar to these, I suppose. Uh, they've got a stopped chanter, whereas we have an open chanter. It's a parallel chanter, a par sorry, a parallel bore, whereas the Highland pipe chanter and this chanter is a conical bore. So that's right away, that's a huge Just difference. Just show us that on there. So yeah. That's conical. You can see the reed that's vibrating in here. It starts off, the sound waves are going down a narrow, narrow chamber, but it's flaring out as it goes down. So that's amplifying the sound. And these are in the key of A, whereas these are in the key of D. That's there, the small uh, chamber there, and it's parallel bore inside, so it's not flaring. It's a nice, sweet sound, but that's in the key of D. You can get them in other keys. Uh, these bellows pipes, I really, I think they're a beautiful, beautiful instrument. They appear in Scottish literature for the first time in a play written by King James IV in the early 15th century. And apparently King James IV also played these pipes. earliest references to the Great Highland bagpipe in Gaelic literature, that's a bit later. So we're finding these in Scottish literature before them. Um, but the big the, thing was Gaelic was an oral tradition, wasn't it? So there wasn't a lot written. No, that, that, that's, that's exactly it. Um, I'll maybe come on to that a wee bit later, but that's, that's, uh, that's a, fundamental, uh, a fundamental aspect. The bagpipes are essentially a pastoral instruments uh, and as I say they were found all over Europe in Gaelic Scotland and in Ireland we however we find it becoming more of a martial instrument a way of incitement to battle to lament the dead and so on remember remember people and saluting chiefs and all that kind of thing we really have the lowland and border piper society to thank for solely bringing about the re-emergence in, in Scotland in, of these bellows pipes. And that was from about nine, the 1980s onwards. Uh, these pipes, they, they may be popular again today, and they certainly are popular again today, but most pipers, they tend to ignore, to a large extent, the repertoire, the music of the lowlands, and instead they, go, they play highland music on a lowland instrument. There's nothing wrong with that, but, you know. Um, but there's lots of good lowland music. Oh, there's there's, ex there's some really good stuff. There's some really good music and, um, well, you, you started off there, you got a little bit of it, but it's just too cold today to, to play much, much longer. The reeds can't handle it. The older repertoire of each form of bagpipe, Lowland and Highland, it fits each, in each instrument. The Highland pipe found a place in daily life in Gildham very quickly, um, and by the mid-16th century we can see it's become an integral part of the Gale's way of life. Um, and its music reflected the rhythms of the language, free from external 
influences, and I think that's quite important. It's it's, free, it, 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 it's developing, and it's music. It's a unilingual society, free from external influences. So it, it, it's developed pretty much in isolation. Going back to the small pipes that I mentioned, having a key, it meant they could go up and down the octave, and that suits a lot of that type of music. Um, the Highland chanter can't do that, and that suits its type of music. Highland pipe music, uh, uh, you know, when, when we're talking its type of music, I'm really meaning the Peebroch Kilmore tradition. And Kilmore is literally the big music. It's essentially an air, a theme, with variations. Um, in Gaelic, the air is called the Urlar, which is the ground, essentially. Um, most people, they couldn't read or write. So, as you say, it was tr the, the music was transmitted orally. It was sung in a system of vocables. We, we call this Canterach. It's de debatable how, how involved the, the Canterach was. It was much later on that it became written down. Uh, because cause these people at the time, they're, 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 you have to bear in mind that they're illiterate. So it was later that somebody, Colin Campbell, was probably the best example of got one of his things here. So towards the end of the next century, you find it being written down. So the music's put onto the stave, and the use of Kandrach, I think, would have declined gradually. Although it is still used by a lot of pipers today. We still use it today. We use a form of it today. We don't use Colin, we don't really use Colin Campbell's, um, Canterach, because it's really quite formal. Because the, uh, the, the Gales, you know, so much of it was an oral tradition. They passed things on from one generation to, to mm -hmm. the next to the storytelling. Yeah. And they certainly would have done the same with the Canterach. Well, it would have, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's really onomatopoeia, and uh, I, I should probably give you a quick demonstration. The note low G in the Canterach, uh, in Colin Campbell's Canterach, sorry. Would be is M. Uh, Low A is N. Uh, B is O. Uh, and so on. E is A. Uh, High G is D. Uh, but when the notes are played with the embellishments, and that's a feature of Highland piping, is embellishments, grace notes, uh, turluas, grips, and so on. It, 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 with the embellishments, those notes then become, for example, low A with a G grace note is him. B is he o, and so on. D with a G grace note is ha. E is he. F is he. High G would be he. I mean, I'm saying this, but I really should be singing it. <laughs> I can't sing. <laughs> I'm covering this quite quickly, I know that. But um, so, when singing a tune, or trying to transmit a tune, these vocables, they help, they really do help. For example, there's a common motif in Gilmore. It's called the Heherin. So it goes, it's H-I-H-A-R-I-N, Heherin. And you can hear it go, Heherin. He her in. He her in. And that probably came from a classic, the cadence. And that starts a lot of Gaelic uh, classic music. The he her in. So, so you're saying the bagpipes weren't here until about the 15th, 16th century, is that right? Um, no, I think there were some really primitive versions making it to Scotland. Parts of Scotland, parts of... I mean, that tune, um, that I think the Battle of Harlaw, I don't think that there were any pipes at Harlaw, and that was when was that, 14, 14, 10, it's too early. The Clan Robertson say that there was, they had bagpipes at Bannockburn in 1314. I don't believe it. 
Mm. It's far too... See, there's no surviving instruments. That's what, I'm, I'm not saying there weren't. There's no evidence for it. You've got to be careful. You've got to, there's no evidence for it. Mm. The evidence for pipes with one drone, two drones, three drones. We've got plenty of them. It's one at Blair Castle, as you know. Mm. We've got two drones, mm. not three. The one that we've got in the college, two drones. But there were, at that time, three drones. What I'm trying to say is, there was no consistency. This consistency came after the 17th century. Yeah, interesting point. I'm, I'm covering this quite quickly. That's so, okay. Uh, it, but so, it's not a music lesson, is yes, it? It's yeah. aimed at the amateur. It's yeah. aimed at the ignoramus like just me. Just an overview, eh? Yeah. So when singing a tune, all these vocables put together, um, they help with transmitting the, the tune to another piper quite accurately. It'll become more clearer if we actually look at a tune from the period. And I've got here in front of me, Lament for Donald Duel Mackay. It's a, it's a really good tune. For, um, it was composed in the mid 17th century. Donald Mackay was the first Lord Ray, he was the chief of Clan Mackay, died in 1649. The tune was composed by John Mackay, the blind piper of Gerlach. I think may have been related to him. And we've got the Cantarich, which, you know, if you look at it here, it's he harin dili, he he, he he. Etc. 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 And you look, if you look at that without knowing what it's the melody and etc., you won't know. You, you won't have a clue. It'd be meaningless. But that sounds on the the chanter anyway. I'll just do it in the chanter. <laughs> So this continues into the variations. By variations, I mean variations on the, 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 the theme notes of the ground, the air. And they're based on uh, embellishments or ornaments. Whereas the variations you find in lowland pipe tunes is mainly of runs and arpeggios, which which I've heard okay. some already, and we'll, we'll hear some later on. When I, the, the highland pipers, we hear most about in the records and in songs and poems they enjoyed a higher status than pipers elsewhere um, a lot of clan chiefs had pipers as part of their domestic life we know the names of some of them um, only some of them because the records from that period they can be quite obscure and not full uh, some don't even mention the name of of the of their domestic staff, but some do, some do the bards, pipers. Uh, the earliest record of this is from 1604. You know Robert McElwee is listed in the, uh, the the Laird of Buchanan's papers. He was his piper. A wee bit later, 1636, there's a written record of the captain of Clan Ranald's piper. I just can't remember his name. So domestically, as I say, pipers would play in the morning to awaken the laird, chief retinue, invariably, but not always, uh, to mark the arrival and departure of guests, uh, to play as part of the work process. More often than not, the piper was seen as a, a gentleman in his own right, with his own servant, his own gilly, to carry his pipes for him. 
not always, but it, it, you know, <laughs> some of them lived rent free, others others didn't, others paid a partial rent maybe. Going back a little further, we see that the, the Battle of Pinky near Edinburgh in 1549, an army of Highlanders was involved and the French author Jean de Beauger, he wrote in his, his journal, quote, now I just need to get this so I get it right. And while the French prepared for combat, the wild Scots incited themselves to arms by the sound of the bagpipes. <laughs> okay. But back to the lowland pipe, which I played at the start. The tunes that I played, or tried to play, because it was just so cold, were, um, I think it was Over the Dyke and Till Her Laddie. Um, tried to, I tried to play a bit of Jingle and Geordie, but it just didn't happen. These are all from the early 17th century. The Jingle and Geordie refers to George Herriot. He was James VI's goldsmith and his jeweller. <clears throat> and the founder of George Herriot's school in Edinburgh. His nickname comes simply from the sound of coins clinking in his purse. <laughs> a wealthy man. Um, and I played the old setting of Terribus, a borders tune. The pipe score of Terribus was first published in the early 18th century, but the tune was known for a long time. Many of these tunes, Highland and Lowland, they were published for the first time in fiddle collections, lute collections, <clears throat> and so on. The first music collection with bagpipe, of, of bagpipe music, wasn't published until much later. Here's Joseph MacDonald's book, um, as you can see the, the date on it, roughly circa 1760 and this was the this is this is highland pipe this is a highland it's not really a collection it's more of a manual written by young young joseph mcdonald they wrote it um on his way to calcutta actually where he where he died unfortunately so that's that one and then there's this one here the book shown in the cover is in the A.K. Bell Library down in Perth, and that's William Dixon's manuscript. And that is the oldest known manuscript of pipe music and the most important source of music uh, for the borders, the lowlands. So this is lowland pipe music? It's lowland pipe music, but it's also with a big Northumbrian influence. It was written by, written down by William Dixon in the date there, 1733. So again, we're way off, we're, we're way out, we're into the 18th, 18th century now. By the time the music's getting written down, the bagpipe music's been written down. <clears throat> Fascinating. Yeah. The melodies were known and played, but just not published until way after this period. Uh, as I've already suggested, much pipe music was adapted from elsewhere. Um, all music, all musicians, intermingle, music travels, soldiers, traders, drovers, and so on. So the music and influences inevitably flow in multiple directions in every generation. You, f you find the same tunes with subtle, not so subtle differences um, in parts and variations all over Scotland, all around the regions and further afield in England and in Ireland. Good music has and always will transfer from one medium to another after all and still be good music. And in the 17th century there's a huge crossover 
an overlap of music. That said, lowland piping probably had more in common with Northumbrian piping than it did with Peebrough. Absolutely. It's interesting because they're actually both in the same area. They're both, one's the north of England and the other one is lowland Scotland. They, they lap into each other, don't they? Well, I, I remember years ago at a conference, a, a bagpipe conference, where someone said they would, they would find it absurd that a piper in the 17th century, Jedburgh, Hoyk, Melrose, Gala Shields, for example, would have been less influenced by the styles and techniques 20 miles or so south in Northumberland. Yeah, than those 200 miles to the north. <laughs> the repertoire of lowland piping during this period is, is utterly Scottish, though. The music that's played on that is utterly Highland. Yeah. It, it is, it just, that's, it's Highland. This music. There's the ebb and the flow, there's, there's too much of an ebb and flow. And to, to, the music is full of arpeggios. And then so is Northumbrian music, but Northumbrian pipes have got a closed chanter. The type of fingering over the border with Northumbrian pipes is, is closed fingering, whereas it's, it's in, in, in lowland Scottish piping, I think, and certainly in Highland piping, obviously, it, it, it's, it's, it's open piping, so if I do the scale on here, if it was a Northumbrian scale, it'd be... You know, it's that staccato closed fingering, whereas that, the way we would do it... It's open. In fact, the earliest known version or setting of the melody that was used in the song Killy Cranky, it can be found in the recorder section of a book published in 1709, the tune was known for a long time and it's called If Ye Had Been. And here it is here transcribed onto the bagpipe scale by, by a friend of mine. I'll play it. To this tune was written soon after the battle of Kelly Cranky, but the words to the popular song heard today did not appear or be published uh, till almost a full century later in 1789 by Robert Burns. But by that time you can you can hear the melody it developed by that time. See that was absolutely fascinating and but I know there's more to um, the story of piping and because you've you know, sent me an even longer manuscript of information. So, um, what are we going to cover beyond here? So, what in the next session that you do, what will we be talking about? Uh, we could talk about um, much more, much more in depth about the music played on the Highland bagpipe. Much more in depth about that. I think we should cover that. I'll maybe play a few examples as well uh, when it's a bit warmer, <laughs> and um, maybe some of the European. I put our Euro European dimension into the, the, the lowland piping as well. <coughs> we'll maybe touch on that. And so the important lesson that we've learned from this session is the lowland pipes and the significant part that they played. Yeah, and, 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 and nationally. Yeah. Nationally. And, and something that we've forgotten about for a very long time, although there's... And it's, it, I find it very interesting that there's a revival from the 1980s, and that's very recent, really. It's been a totally successful revival. Yeah. Totally successful. Um, I, I just wish more of the pipers that are playing these instruments would look at some of the lowland tunes in the, in the repertoire because some of them are quite quite good. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed that. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Jim. And I hope you get warm. <laughs> <laughs>